Hello everybody. Uh, if I could have your attention, if you could take your seats now please. We're having our next presenter, so... Um... Please take your seats. Please take your seats. The noise. Okay. We're ready to go. So, our next speaker is Michelle Kingston. Michelle is our own. I think Michelle's already pretty well known, but Michelle is our own cosmic angel. She's been um, a, a guiding light for, for many people on the Mornington Peninsula for, for decades. She's just uh, radiant and very aware and um, yeah, so I don't know what more I can say. She's been a light to, to many people and she runs her own um, Divine Light Centre down in St Andrews Beach in Rye. And she's got a full calendar of uh, meditations and, uh, and all sorts of things. And her oracle cards are sold throughout Australia. Um, so without further ado, I'll leave you with Michelle Kingston. Thanks, Guy. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to thank Guy and Michelle, first of all, so much for all the work they've done in organising this event, because I know how hard they've worked. And I've seen how um, careful they've been with um, integrating everybody and all different aspects of people's needs and things like that and they've done so well and they've done a really good job so thank you Guy and Michelle for putting this together because I feel it's a really important event and we may not know on the ground yet what it's all about in the future but we're all called together I believe for a purpose today and um, We'll find out what it is during the weekend, but on my way home, I had to duck home and get a book. I, I was told that um, some of us are to carry some copper, or 12 pieces of copper that we all need to join together on the last day to activate a stargate here. But I don't know if anyone else has had the same calling, um, and I'll just leave that open. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, now with the, f I'll, I'll just go over to this picture first. I just wanted to talk on this picture because it's a beautiful, everyone knows this picture of the flower of life with the 19 circles, which is seen in all the pyramids and everywhere. It's actually the symbol of your conception. When two cells come together and uh, multiply, it forms into the flower of life, which is a cell that's inside all plants, um, all living beings, trees, rocks, everything has this sacred symbol in it. And um, I just thought I'd mention that because it's too nice to, to pass anyway. Um, now, first of all, I wanted to just read out a little bit of my background because it will have uh, something to do with the, the presentation. And it's, it's actually quite hard to say because it was a bit of a story of what happened to me on the journey here. So I hope it doesn't bore you, but I'd just like to share with you today um, information, drawings and diagrams that will come through this book that has been photographed and put on a slide show, which I've never used a microphone either, so, or had a, a slide show made, so I've always worked old school with 
um, drawings and maps, star maps and things that are just done through channel and put into many books. Um, so the story where it all began was um, I went through, oops, at a young age, a reason of being here. I wondered what my purpose was on earth in primary school, like all of us. We wondered why are we here, what's our purpose, there must be a higher purpose and everything. So I started with my parents, who I love and thank, first of all, because I found out later on that I feel my father's a Syrian and my mother's a Pleiadian um, over time, which I didn't know that at the time, of course. But then growing up through primary school, I um, started to notice a few things and, and went up to the teacher in grade two and said, how come I'm stuck in this body? Why can't I fly around anymore? Uh, why, where are our, where's our light body? Why are we here? And uh, things like that. And the teacher couldn't answer me. So I sort of closed myself down a bit with school because they didn't have the answers to the questions I was asking. Although I still went along, of course, and, and loved the art and everything. Um, yes, yeah, so then um, moving on during the school years, and then I started to see things with my third eye, tragedies in the family. Uh, when my brother got glass in his eye on a train, I saw red all around him before the, the train window broke. And I had a, a very strong telepathic connection with my father. And he went away that weekend and um, didn't know that we were all in the hospital because Wes had glass in his eye. And we sort of telepathically, that's the word, telepathically, called Dad home and he came home and said, what's wrong? And he picked up on our, um, and that's when I realised we have another connection before the mobile phone or the telephones were there. So things like that just started to develop and all of us can relate to these sort of stories. And uh, time went on and then I met my husband and we started travelling and we went over to, first we went around Australia and we went around for a year and we lived in caves and we lived in tents and it was just amazing out in the red ochre, the raw continent that Australia has to offer. We went to Monkey Mire, which is a, a huge dolphin portal in the southern hemisphere and uh, lived in a cave for three months. And um, it was amazing up at the bluff. I don't know if you've heard of it. And then uh, came home and built a little house in Dramana, which was only six square which was a story where the Crystal Guardian being started to come to me in lights. I started to see lights. And I had just joined a psychic development circle back then and I asked my teacher, what are these lights? And he said, just tune in and see what you get. And I tuned in and I saw with my third eye beings, but they were physically um, lights that in different colours and moving around. And then I ended up drawing them in the Crystal Guardians, which I'll explain a bit later about them. Um, so we lived in this tiny little house in Dramana for 12 years and we had our kids there. And uh, when I was pregnant with Hals, my first son, I was taken on a craft which landed um, next door to my our window. It just landed because we had blocks of land all around us. We were one of the first houses in, in Dramana at the top of the hill and this craft landed next door and I, I walked on. The guides came to the window in white and I followed them. They felt friendly. I walked onto the ship and we were taken off before I stepped on through the um, pathway that it had like a ramp. Uh, they asked me, did you bring all the seeds? <laughs> and um, I said, well, I've, I looked down and I happened to have been wearing a bag with all these seeds. And um, so I said, yes, I've got the seeds, and that we went off to another planet which looked like Venus. It was a beautiful planet. The beings had uh, fair hair, blue eyes in white. They were tall, but I realised it was much further away. It was almost in another galaxy. And um, I must have spent a lot of time there because I planted all the seeds. I had every single seed from the earth, pumpkin, sunflower, pine tree, gum tree, every species that was here and I was asked to plant in say an acre or a plot they said all these seeds and I must have been there for about 10 years because they all grew into their full size the pine trees were enormous the gum trees and then I noticed other beings from other star systems also came to this 
planet, I guess you could call it, and they also uh, planted all the seeds that they brought from their home planet, which wasn't near the variety that we had here on Earth. Their, theirs looked really barren, their um, vegetables looked very strange, um, they didn't have the colour variety we had. Um, it was quite interesting really and then I was taken back home and I was still six months pregnant of course but I was in another time frame so whether that was another aspect of my body or a parallel life I don't know and then when Hals was born um, he had he was a three-day labor so he got a, a long labor and the doctors wanted to investigate him because his head was a different shape it was like a heart and so they took him away and wanted to test his um, blood and everything. They, they wanted to just um, explore and make sure he was all right, I guess. And because I'm an O negative blood type, I think they wanted to check. Um, they knew that because they were giving me these antigen needles. I think they wanted to see if he was the same or whether there was a cross, perhaps. But they ended up um, testing his blood for every two hours for 10 days in the Frankston Hospital. And by the end of this, I heard the nurses laughing as they put another needle into him. And I rang Evan, my husband, and said, look, bring the car seat, we're getting out of here. So we actually stole him, <laughs> or well, not stole him, but we thought, let's just get out of here in the night and took Harley back home to Dramana and he was fine. Um, so he turned out all right. And then when he went to primary school, he was a brain. He still, they called him brains at the hospital. Uh, they called him Brains at Kinder. He had a high academic and uh, through scholars in grade two. Uh, but anyway, that's the, the story of Harley anyway, which um, I was meant to, I just skipped a little bit about my father because my father um, was a very interesting man. He was one of those beings that could do anything. He could build houses, boats, cars, but he could also reach telepathic um, ranges. He had friends that were the blue ones, he communicated with ESP, um, uh, he was quite extraordinary anyway and then he started writing down all these books and he told us, the five kids, to collect seeds for your children's children, there will be no food or a shortage of food, he told us to watch the water, uh, they're going to change the water, there's going to be land um, continents moving, we'll have 12 land masses. He told us all this information right back in 1966 it was and um, he wrote books and books on it which my mother started to get very afraid of this and she thought he was having a breakdown and ended up calling the doctor when he came in and said he saw Jesus in the garage who spoke to him and told him to write all this information and my mother freaked out, rang the doctor who came round and said definitely a schizophrenic we need to take him into the hospital and he was put on a table where they electrocuted his brain uh, three times. He saw himself rise up and ended up um, a vegetable almost in a chair in the lounge room for 10 years. And it's only now I've realised that in 1966 was the time when the Westall UFOs landed. I saw an article in the newspaper that um, the UFOs landed at the Westall Primary School. And I don't know if he's connected to that at all, but it was the same year. So there could be a, a connection, I don't know. But anyway, I would come home from school and just put my hands on my dad's head or on his shoulders, on his skull, and he said, stay there, darling. I don't know what you're doing, but something's working. So I stayed there and I, that's where I learned how to heal, basically because he got well and he ended up working again and um, everything moved on forward for him. But he won't talk about God or... He had his pituitary gland blown out, so he won't mention God. He just sort of stays undercover or very, very low key uh, these days. But back then he also built a machine in the garage which he dropped a motor out of his car into the boat and then he put something else into the car and it was a, a car that would run on hydro water or something. He had an amazing invention, all these inventions going on and he stood up in council and said, put a fence around this country, we can grow everything here. Look after our backyard and we can grow everything. We've got all the ingredients here to look after Australia. 
but he was um, again shut away and um, yeah, put away. So that was um, back then in the past. And then after that, Evan and I, coming back to Dramana, when we had our children, we've got two sons, Evan got a job over in Colorado um, in the snowy Alps over there at Keystone. So we went over there for 10 months to work in the snow and Harley was two and I fell pregnant with my second son over there, Jamison, because I had a dream of these beautiful Native American Indians came in a dream and showed me a teepee with an elk on it. So later on um, that came through in a, um, another vision through my spiritual teacher who christened him saying his name is He Who Runs With The Elk. And then I thought, that's interesting, I wonder if I've got ancestors or anything over there. I didn't know a lot about my ancestry. And it turns out my nana, who my father's mother, was from, Mount, um, from California, but her father was the Arkansas kid who rode a horse um, over there like no other. Apparently he was in the circus and rode horses. He could pick up a bit of tissue paper going around the corner on his horse at hundreds of miles an hour. And he came to Australia anyway and uh, married my nana's mother, who um, was 16. Um, well, he met her then in the Wirtz Circus, so my great-grandfather rode with all the Native American Indians. He was a white fellow, but he went coast to coast with them and he was raised by the Native American Indians over there. I think I was meant to go over to Colorado to find out that missing piece of my her heritage or ancestry. and. Um, Coming back here, uh, where was I going with that? <laughs> sorry, so much. Yeah, the story. I'm giving you the family story. Sorry, I'm supposed to be giving you the slideshow of the galactic cycle, but we'll get there. This is all part of it because my father um, always told me when I was 12 to collect seeds, and uh, when he had a breakdown, I searched the galaxy for his soul because he changed as a person. He didn't seem like the same man at all. And I thought, what's happened to his soul? And I searched the galaxy. So that was the beginning of my star search, really. But living in Colorado, after work, we went down to Arizona. We bought a little car over there, and we drove down to Arizona, the Grand Canyon, and all around there. And we got so lost down there, we ended up accidentally driving into Area 51. <laughs> oh my God. We went through these big gates and headed towards a mountain, which we, I had no idea at the time what that was. And uh, 10 minutes in into the gates, we had the police on our back, sirens, guns, everything. Scroll down, put your hands on the dashboard and pull over, we heard through a speaker. And so we pulled over and they walked towards us with guns one on each side of us and Harley was asleep in the back of the car and I just shielded him with light, please stay asleep. And uh, we had to put our hands on the dashboard and not move and they wanted any form of ID, uh, wanted to know what we're doing in this area. We were in a little black car so maybe they thought it was spy, spies or something. So they took our passports because we had everything with us and they walked back um, towards their car with the guns still on us. And I had a baby in my tummy, so that's turning around, I was petrified. And they walked back to the car and looked up on their computers, our ID, and saw that we were from Australia and came back and let us go. And said, get out of here, you're not allowed in this area, do not come back. And they escorted us back to the gate and locked the gate. I thought, what was that place? And at that stage, I was just learning to see uh, with my remote viewing eye, which we all have. So I thought, I'm going to go and have a look what that is in there. And I went underneath. And oh my God, I saw these silver buildings under there, four storeys high, spaceships, silver people, lots of beings in laboratories, working on all sorts of assignments under there. And I didn't have any understanding of what it was. And I wondered if it was connected to us or to Harley or to my father in any way um, as we came home. And then we came back to Australia and um, here we are. Well, they've all grown up now. So I didn't even need the paper. I thought I did. <laughs> Sorry. So I just needed to share that with you so you knew a bit of my background of where I'm coming from with the, with the next part of the story. Oh, I'm back to there. Hang on.
Now, I've never used any of these um, gadgets. I'm a bit old school, so I don't want to... No? No? No. Ah, uh -huh, there we are. There's a picture of our beautiful neighbourhood galaxy, the Andromedan galaxy. And uh, we're about 300 million miles away from that, apparently. I, mean, I don't know how they measure, but they do through mathematics and parallaxes and things like that. So that's our neighbouring galaxy, which is a, a beautiful picture of what it looks like here. And they're all suns, actually. They're not stars. They're suns, and uh, there's planets around the suns, which we don't see the planets because they're so small or they don't have as much light as the sun unless they're close to the sun. So that's a beautiful one of our Andromedan galaxy, which is where it all began for our origins, I believe, uh, when we our Milky Way galaxy broke off the Andromedan galaxy. And it could be the part of the beginning of Genesis, I don't know, but we broke away from there and separated and we're out on the edge of the Orion armband in the Milky Way galaxy, which many years ago they thought we were going to drift off into oblivious. But I asked the guides about that and they said, no, it's an arc, everything's in a circle, a cycle, and we're going to um, come back into the arms of Andromeda again in possibly another 300 or 250 million years. Uh, will collide apparently with them. But my facts are not correct because a lot of this work's just come through um, channels and visions and things like that. Now I'll see if it works again. Oh yes, the prism of Lyra. Has anyone heard of that? Apparently when we broke away from the prism, uh, from the Andromedan galaxy, our galaxy was formed through what's known as the prism of Lyra or a white hole. Hello. Um, and so this is from the Hare Krishnas, actually, this poster. But it's a good example of how everything in the all is outside where the higher sun is and, and all the cosmos of creation is down in the lower part of the, of the um, picture. And uh, the prism of Lyra was when we all go through there. And um, in Lyra, which is a star system, or it's a sun, they're all suns, Arcturus, Sirius, Orion and their suns, and uh, they have plenty of planets around them. Oh, that's um, our solar system, which you're all aware of that. And we're out on the orbit. And I've always wondered, in some of the uh, meditations and visions that I've seen, because I do a bit of remote viewing or travelling, astral travelling in meditations, and things just seem natural to me now, and I, I expect that everybody else can do it. So if I start saying that I, I've been here, I hope you understand that it's from my either light body or astral uh, travelling or just from my consciousness. So that's a picture of our solar system and you can see the, uh, the belt there of um, outside Mars, the asteroid belt, which once was our moon. We had a central moon, a beautiful big moon called Moldek, which they say blew up in the galactic wars, but it might have just been its time. Um, I don't know if they can prove it, but a lot of the Moldavite crystal comes from the planet Moldek. And when we had the beautiful um, moon in the centre, the sun had its twin flame. It had its partner and uh, it's lost that now. It's the asteroid belt. So the inner side of the asteroid belt, we lost consciousness and fell down from what they call grace. This is what I believe, I might be wrong. And the outside of the asteroid belt, they're still communicating with one another. A lot of them are still up in higher um, dimensions and communicating with ships and things like that outside the asteroid belt, which is what I've seen when I travelled out that way with my guides and things. And uh, this is a picture of the Earth chakras which I'm not sure if it's in the right spot, but it doesn't matter, is our, our beautiful uh, planet Earth. Now this I got the information from Robert Kuhn, he's an Aboriginal who's from Tasmania, you may have heard of him, and taught me about the rainbow serpent or the rainbow snake, which is the chakras around the planet. As we have chakras, so does the Earth, and there are many of them. And the rainbow snake moved in 2012. So we've always been the solar plexus in Australia, which is the yellow chakra of the lucky country, the happy country, abundance. But now we've moved to the green as the snake is turning. 
and uh, many of the beautiful beings up at Uluru, including the Aboriginal women, danced when they knew the rainbow snake was about to move. They danced around the Olgas to Uluru with their sticks and they saw a water hole that was so low, the water had uh, dropped right down to a level so low it revealed all these carvings of dolphins. So they knew it was time, time that the snake was returning or moving to the next, for the next age to come. Because every 2,000 years or so, 2,100 something, 64 I think, uh, the rainbow snake moves. So we've had Mount Shasta in California has always been the base chakra and that's turning now into purple because the snail, a uh, snail, the tail of the snake and the head of the snake join. It's a circle. So the red is going to the purple and that's going to become the purple um, chakra. And you can just see in America the shift that's going on with the consciousness of the people. A lot of old structures are breaking down in America, but there's so much light coming out of America and uh, with all the different places and portals. So Australia always being the solar plexus, we're going to turn into the heart, which is to do with farming. And uh, the heart is Lemuria. We're returning back to Lemuria here, with the motherland. And this will take possibly over a few hundred years. But um, many, many moons ago, um, Australia was Lemuria. And it was joined on to, they say, Hawaii, Tasmania, Antarctica. It was a beautiful continent. Uh, very fifth dimensional in its energy. The beings here were mainly of light in early Lemuria because they couldn't, um, they were here to test the ethers. They came in a fifth and sixth dimensional form such as a fairy or a butterfly and then when they chose to stay they embodied into crystals and you can still see these beautiful Lemurian beings in the crystals today as a rainbow or as a a uh, lovely prism of light and sun.